Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to all of you for being here. You know, it, it does, it's just, I know we, we often say this still, but seeing people face to face after these last several difficult years, it, the energy is palpable. I know most of you were obviously in the talk this morning, which was outstanding. And it's a pleasure for me to be back here. You know, this role that I have on campus, I'm, I'm still on the Haas faculty, but I'm basically on leave and I'm doing a, it's a staff, 100% staff role at the campus level, this innovation and entrepreneurship role. And Laura, as she mentioned, she and I work very closely together. And virtually everything I get credit for in this new job, Laura actually did, okay? So, <laughs> so that's, you know, it, it, I don't tell many people that, but this is a safe space, so I thought I would share it with you. Um, so so this, this question of culture, I think, you know, if there's something I'm obsessed with, some of you know this just because I know many of you in the room, uh, this is a bit of an obsession for me, right? It's, it's just one of these things where we think about, all right, well, how, how important is culture? Um, and all of you, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't done some thinking on this, and many of you are founders or you're funders, right? Venture, you've got a big portfolio of companies you funded or whatever your role is, or, or you're just interested in culture. Um, but let me start with a very quick thought experiment, right? Because, so I'm an economist, most of you, many of you know that. And I was not geared to think about culture as something that's really important. I mean, most economists think about, well, uh, like, what are the incentives? I mean, is there compensation for that? Is, you know, who owns the decision rights, the, 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 the structural issues that, that matter in explaining human behavior? Whereas culture is really the stuff, like Jenny Chapman, for those of you that took Jenny's classes and so forth, this is the stuff of psychologists. It's the stuff of social psychologists and sociologists and so forth, which is really, can be pretty far away from economics. So I came to this much later. If somebody had said, does culture matter to me 20 years ago in the way organizations run, I probably, you know, would have expressed some skepticism. So I just thought I would, I would start there. Um, the, ex the thought experiment I want to I mention to you is this, and, and you don't have to answer it, so I'm it's, it's basically a question, but I really just want you to think about the question. Um, if you thought about Chu Hall, some of you, hopefully, you, if you haven't yet, you'll get a chance to see Chu Hall, right? Chu Hall is, is right out here. And it was about $65 million all in to do Chu Hall. So that's, that's as tangible an asset as you're going to find, right? Tangible, durable. And, and you could say, well, yeah, but the value of it, that's just the cost. I mean, what's the value? And we've got exactly, okay, but let's just value it at, at cost, at, at $65 million. And then when you think about the defining principles, which were crowdsourced, right? Some people say, oh, yeah, you were Dean and stuff like that. But I didn't come up with confidence without attitude. I didn't come, this stuff, nobody, nobody has yet said, Hey, Haas, where, how did you come up with question the status quo? It's like, that's, as Berkeley, that's as mothership as anything you're ever going to find, right? <laughs> that said, you know, is the dean of, I, I don't mean to pick on other business schools, but maybe some of you heard me say this, but is the dean of Harvard Business School going to stand up and say, confidence without attitude, we really mean it? <laughs> <laughs> or question the status quo? Right? Or, you know, beyond yourself. And I don't want to just pick, right? So when you think about, this is stuff that is deep within us and it's competitively separating. We didn't do it just for competitive separation, but it's pretty darn separating, right? All right, what, where am I going with this? Tangible asset, Chu Hall, 65 million-ish. As intangible an asset as you could come up with. Those four defining principles. If somebody told you, you have to give one of them up, which one would you give up? Might not be obvious, but the fact that at least it's a live question tells you something about the value of intangible assets. Right? So um, we're talking about something more specific here today, how founders manage culture. Some of this is going to be linked to how we as leaders manage culture. I want, to, I want to focus this as much as I can. Part of this, I would like this session to be as crowdsourced as possible. I would love it at the end of my presentation if you would say, look, I've worked with a lot of founders. I've funded a lot of founders. I'm going to go through some mistakes, some culture leadership mistakes that I see founders making. That's basically the end of this talk. The last seven slides are seven mistakes that I see founders making. 
on the culture front. And invariably, some of you are going to say there was something really missing on there, and I'd love to hear it. We would love to hear it uh, if you've had a similar experience. So we'll get there. But that's what I kind of mean by crowdsourced. You know, people can disagree on this stuff, and that's just great. The marketplace for ideas is open, and I really want to hear from you later on in the talk. Okay? All right. So here we are. Um, two key categories. Now, I haven't defined culture yet. So here's the way I want to think about culture. I want to think about it as shared values, no surprise there, shared values, and shared actions. Shared actions is really important. Like, how does it map into, if you're in HR, you would probably say shared behaviors, but, but I'm going to say shared actions. Set to achieve something. Ooh, what's that last part? Shared values and shared actions. Set to achieve something. Now, this is one of the things I've learned from Professor Chapman, Jennifer Chapman. I mean, cultures arise, will always arise organically, you know that, whether you like it or not. The question is, can you make a culture intentional? Can you make it something that helps you achieve a certain outcome? Can you use it as an instrument? I don't want to get too operational or functional about this, but set to achieve a particular outcome. Now, maybe it's not set to achieve a particular outcome, but your culture will produce outcomes whether you like it or not. And there is a culture in every group of people or organization, whether you like it or not. So I, I, I want to think about that intentionality. We as leaders and managers, are we expert setters of culture? And what objectives are we aiming culture at? And, and that's a big question. I haven't mentioned startups really yet at all. But if startups aren't thinking that way, you know, why Andreessen Horowitz, Ben Horowitz, why, why did he write a book on culture? What you do is who you are, is a Ben Horowitz book. Some of you have probably read it, right? In part because great funders, uh, they really want to see that, yeah, look, yeah, I know you're in survival mode. I know this is hard. But if you're not thoughtful about culture and you're the CEO of one of my companies, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to see that you've thought a little bit about this. Now, just to be completely honest, when I was first acting dean, so the first year of my deanship, I was actually acting dean. And I remember one of the board members, I won't mention who, it doesn't really matter, former CEO of the Haas board, um, on the Haas board, former CEO of a, of a big company. And he, he said in a board meeting, a little bit confrontational, a little bit to at least seem that way to me, you know, I'm, I'm in sort of my, I guess, early, late 40s at the time. And he said, leaders set culture. Like, oh, okay. So as, as an economist, I hadn't thought that much about it. And again, Jennifer Chapman's an absolute expert in this area. But, but I haven't forgotten those words, right? Now, is, is setting culture like a necessary condition? Let me you go to the extreme. You could say, no, being able to set culture is a necessary condition to be a good leader. That's a pretty strong statement. I I'm not sure I would go that far. But this idea that this is really important. So if you want to be the founder of a company I'm funding and you haven't thought about culture at all because you'd say, come on, we're, just, we're in survival mode. Watch us survive. It's like um, most funders would say that's not a very good answer. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about content and mostly about execution. So, so those founder mistakes is really all about execution. Content is going to be as specific as the, as, as the number of companies we're going to talk about, right? Every different company sort of ha thinks about its culture a little differently. I'll say a few things about content, but again, mostly about execution here today. And we'll have some time for discussion, as I said. All right. So the, the question of, all right, so how do, how do founders manage culture? Why is that different from CEOs? Um, well, we've got quite small teams, generally. That's not, that won't surprise you. Survival mode, I've used that phrase a bunch of times. It's sort of like, come on. We've got higher priorities than, than culture. Um, and whether people feel good in meetings or however people kind of code the word culture in their minds, the skeptics and so forth. And, you know, it's always true that leaders have a big impact on culture. That's always true. But when you have like two or three founders, it's like there's no getting around the impact that two or three or four founders or even the first, you know, five or ten people in the company are going to have on, on, on uh, culture. So, so I want to come back to this, but uh, this is, these are three, of the, and these are not the only three ways, but these are three ways, obviously, that make the, the culture context different. Um, okay, so, you know, 
yes, the founder context is different in some ways, but it's also very similar in a bunch of ways, and I don't want that to be lost on people. So if you're going to remember one thing about culture content from this session, I would like you to remember that D word up there, different. Make it different. If you're out there saying, we've got this strong culture, and, and I'm not going to use any words, because every time I say a word, people say, oh, that's, that's one of our, our key principles or core values or what have you. So it's dangerous territory to give examples. But you know, there are a lot of terrific, completely unobjectionable words out there. And they are completely non-separating. So if you want your people to talk about, the, you know, actually our students and graduates, some of you too, I hope, they will sometimes put the defining leadership principles on their resume. So I want you to ask me about confidence without attitude when you look at my resume and you're interviewing me. And, and so will, it sort of, will people be, have enough pride about, about those values, about the culture, that they want to talk about it? If culture is being implemented because senior managers are beating people with it, it's, it's not going to stick. It's not going to be real. Young people are going to cringe. All of those things. My kids tell me, don't use the word cringe. You don't, you don't use it correctly. Um, and I, the other day I used the word meme and they said, don't use that word. You have no idea. Um, so so I, think, I think this idea though that, that uh, if people... Oh, so let me give you some examples. Danae Ringelman um, was, what, yeah, one of the co-founders of Indiegogo. And I remember she gave a talk here when they were launching Indiegogo, and they kind of reverse engineered the, the initial articulation of their culture. I mean, they had a very small team, launch team, and they were asking people, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Why are you loving what we're doing? Why are we having so much fun together? Let's try and put words to that and then build a culture around that, because that's why we're all so darned excited. Um, there are many other examples, but if you, like for example, confidence without attitude, just, I mean, Haas is not a startup, but just to take an example of that, it's, you know, you could have, we, there are a lot of words, like humility, it's like, yeah, but we're a business school, for crying out loud. It's sort of like, we, we want, not to take away from humility, but, but the, the confidence word is important in that phrase, and there's an inherent tension there, right? And that's, that's part of why that's, that's productive. Um, Totally not a startup, but if you take, I don't know exactly when this got started, but you know, there are a lot of companies that will say we're customer centered, customer focused, right? Customer driven. Um, Amazon came out and said customer obsession. Sort of like, that's going to change some conversations, right? That you can imagine somebody saying in a meeting, that doesn't sound like customer obsession to me, and that's actually going to have some traction in a meeting, for crying out loud, right? And it's not to everybody's taste. That's part of what takes, okay, so different though. It's like find, even if you sort of say, we're all about, find your word, integrity. Find a way to say it differently. <laughs> find a way to say it so it's sort of like, that's sweet, that's sweet. Students always could have been lifelong learning, but it's more than that. Well, you know, at the end of your career, you still have more to learn, right? Okay. And it's more than curiosity. All right. So make it different. This is hard, right? This is hard, but really key. And it's, and it's very general. So same thing for startups, same thing for big companies. Um, leaders' actions matter. This is no, no surprise. I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm going to come back to it later, again, talking about some of the quote-unquote mistakes in terms of culture leadership. Um, and and share, stakeholders calibrate on culture, employees, funders, boards, that's all stuff that, that you've seen before. So when people sort of say, what are, what are the first things you hear in terms of the levers to manage culture? These are like the, among, among the first. People don't always mention the difference part, but I think the difference part is really, is really key. Um, so when I think about uh, the, the, the specific elements of the content, my top three and also for non-founders, make it different, as I mentioned. Drive the business. This is some of the, one of the things that Jenny, I learned from Jenny Chapman. Again, it, it, shared values, shared actions to achieve something. And this idea of can you do it to drive the business? Now, if, if we're trying to, if it's a talent strategy and we're trying to get people to be as excited, you know, in year two as they were in week two, how do we create a, a culture that can help us do that? 
That was the Indiegogo example that I used. And then make it executable. So part of it, too, is we sometimes separate in our brains the difference between content and execution. But, but there are certain things where it's like, look, if we wanted to drive that through what we actually do, drive that through our actions, that's a principle that's executable. So other, we'll come back to this later, but other things equal, it's like, make it executable. Um, now, and sometimes when, when culture principles get so broad, it, it, it's really hard for people to understand what execution even, even looks like. All right. Now, I want to get into execution. So I've, I've already left content behind. I, I mean, most of this talk is about execution. Content is hard. Make it different. If you're going to do one thing, do that, whether you're a founder or, or a non-founder and, and just a leader and, and manager more generally. Make it different. That's key. So when we think about this now, founder context really matters. Small team survival mode uh, founders have a huge impact. No surprise there. And, and then we think about these standard big companies. So now we're talking about execution. If you sort of pick up the textbook and you said, what should the CEO or anybody on the senior team or anybody anywhere in the organization? I heard a phrase not long ago. I love the phrase. We've all heard the phrase, lead from where you are. Like you're a brand new analyst or associate at the company. What does leadership look like from, from your, your vantage, from your role? How about the phrase, lead, lead culture from where you are? You know, I think a lot of people feel like, well, this is, CEOs need to think about this, right? Yeah, of course they do. Founders need to think about this. But if you're not the founder, it's sort of like, I don't need to think about this. Hmm, lead culture from where you are. How do you as an analyst in an organization or whatever the, the entry-level title is, how do you lead culture? How do you spark conversations about shared norms on your team that wouldn't otherwise happen? That's one of the things I talk to a lot of young people about. It's sort of like, what if at lunch with your team, you as an analyst, and there are VPs and there are associates, and you're out to lunch, and you said something like, I mean, actually dining, out to lunch, and, and you said, hey, could, could we just talk about whether having a little bit more room in our conversations as a team to, to test ideas to actually interrogate ideas. Could, could we have a devil's advocate in, in our meetings? Because it seems like, you know, sometimes we kind of get into... Anyways, whatever it is, right, could we just have a conversation about that? And that, that is a form of culture leadership that even, this, you know, even the team member could, could actually have. So, um, but anyways, driving culture into business processes, just at, at the Haas school, culture. If you said, well, how did, you, how did we do this at the Haas School? Sort of like uh, people that are better at operations than I am basically explain this to me. But if you imagine the full set of operations of business processes at the, at the Haas School, right? It's sort of marketing and communications, alumni relations, development fundraising, uh, admissions, career management, uh, hiring faculty, hiring staff, onboarding your people how we interact with the campus, all of these sorts of things. And then if you said, well, let's just take admissions. Well, admissions, it's like which degree program, right? We've got six different degree programs. Well, let's just take one of them. Well, if you take any one of them, it's sort of like there are information sessions, there are interviews, there are letters of recommendation, there are interview assessment forms, who does the interview? interviews and what do the assessment forms look like? All right, they're like even in a single program's admissions, there are like 10 different processes. And it's like, are we really going to come up with four defining leadership principles and, that, and then not drive it through admissions? It's like, whose time are we wasting? Are we serious about this? So it's sort of like, you could go to the information sessions of a lot of top business schools and their deans would never use the word culture or might not. And they certainly wouldn't talk about four things that we take super seriously and we use for admissions. So one of the things you may have heard me say before, but we, you know, in admission sessions where we admit people and then we have like a yield event, they still haven't decided. We just did Cal Day for our undergraduates, but if you thought about an MBA event, for example, and you get into an EMBA program or whatever it is, and you're still deciding between this and another school. One of the things that I said, said to people, and I think Ann effectively says the same thing. 
Hey, if you're meeting somebody next to you that is also deciding whether to come or not, and you're thinking, wow, impressive person, but how did they get through the confidence without attitude interview? And people kind of laugh because it's already shot through our admissions process. But one of the things I would then say is, you might not want to come because it means I, we are talking out of both sides of our mouth. In other words, game on. Game on. If in a 300-person class, six people, 2% are obvious violations, and I'm just picking out one of the principles, confidence without attitude, sort of like, oh, well, that must have been a philanthropic admin or, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's sort of like, you can't do that. So, like, you gotta, you got to play hard if you're going to do this. So driving it through these business processes, again, it's sort of like you could sit down with somebody, especially somebody who's really operationally fluent, and come up with a hundred, at least a hundred levers, a hundred business processes you could drive culture through. All right? And it doesn't mean you should drive them through all 100, but it's like think exhaustively about that. So that's standard big company stuff. I'll be quicker on these others. Drive culture into communications. Drive culture into leadership behavior. Now, very specifically, startups ain't a lot of business processes. So that first one, it's sort of like, are you kidding me? We are just, we are running. We are running together. It's, so, so that lever, it's like, doesn't exist for startups to a first approximation. Of course, it does at some level, but, but not in any significant way. And drive culture through communications. Again, it's sort of like, we, we, are, we are in survival mode, friend. There's, there's not a lot of formal communications going on here. So that's why I'm going to focus on this leadership thing. What, do, what does leadership behavior look like? When you think about culture in startups, the leader's behavior is really fundamental. That's not going to surprise anybody. But that, that was, as I was starting to think about, how do I put this talk together as opposed to a talk about managing culture in a big company, right? It's sort of like, yeah, those are two important categories, one and two, and they're, they're not that important and are not, nowhere near as important in, in the startup context. So drive culture into leadership behavior. And, and what does that look like here? So I'm going to focus on that, as I said, and we're, I'm going to go through seven mistakes that I often see among, I, this is true about leaders more generally, but I think it can be especially true. I tried to sort of identify a subset that I've seen more often among startups. And some of this is, is pretty micro now, right? We're talking about that behavior, but it's like, if you are doing this thing, it will propagate. Your people will think that this is okay, right? You're acting this way, they're going to act way, this way, right? I mean, we've all been in situations where you're kind of pumped up and you, and and, you know, one of the things that I, I, I swear like never, but I know that when my confidence without attitude starts, needs to get in check, sometimes I, I will use language that's like, why did I just use that word? And, and so, so part of it is kind of understanding the ripple effects of leaders who are, you know, if you're the founder, it's a pretty heady thing. I don't have to tell you that. So where does the, how does the headiness get the better of us? That's one way to think about a bunch of these, okay? All right, so let's go through these. Again, I want to hear from you. I want you to say at the end of this, I don't buy these two on your list of seven, and I can't believe you didn't put these two on there or this one on there, whatever. I think that'll be a super discussion because, again, many of you have seen a lot of these, right? You do this all the time. But if you sort of mapped dysfunctional leadership behavior in startup founders into the culture question. That's what we're doing here, okay? That's what we're doing here. All right, so here's number one. <laughs> now, let me, notice I added the word your. Because we have to be honest with ourselves. If you want somebody to give you their money, if you want somebody to dedicate their talent to you for the next two years, you know, you want them to be impressed with you. So I'm not, I'm not sitting here in a glass jar saying, you know, just don't, you know, you shouldn't be obsessed with this. But there's a big distinction between your external stakeholders and market and your internal market, your people, your staff, your people. When you have to be the smartest woman, man in the room, even in your staff meetings, I mean, if you're in front of a VC, I, I get it. But it's, a lot, it's hard for people to separate those contexts, 
Maybe that's the message in this, is that there are different contexts. And in some of them, yeah, you're going to need to impress people. In others, it's, it, it sets a tone, and everybody sees it. All right. So um, here's number two. This, some of you know Marshall Goldsmith. He's a terrific executive coach. This is right out of Marshall Goldsmith. He wrote a wonderful book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. It's, I really like the book. It's a great title, too. It actually links to what our keynote said this morning. Right? You have this success formula. You use it in sales or whatever field you're in. And then you get elevated into a cross-functional enterprise-wide role. Or, as she put it, right, you're an individual contributor and now you're a manager. Sort of like, everybody used my success formula or my playbook. Didn't work at all, right? So anyways, um, one of the things that he does, and I've seen him do this. So he, um, Alan Mulally, at, at formerly Ford, and, and many other very, very senior executives. By the way, uh, Marshall Goldsmith has a terrific executive coaching website. For those of you that are interested in co executive coach resources and kind of you know, self-learning on the executive coaching stuff, Go to Marshall Goldsmith's website. It's absolutely terrific. It's really got a lot of content there. Um, anyways, I've seen him do this. He's invited me. I don't know him that well, but he's invited me to a couple of his coaching sessions with multiple CEOs, and these are quite senior people, bigger companies. They're uh, obviously senior people. Um, and he finds them when they use these words, when they start a sentence with that. So somebody comes up with an idea, and you're in a senior team meeting, and your first word is no, or but, or however, right? It is basically saying, I disagree. Now, disagree, you're entitled to disagree, right? But there are a lot of different, we don't realize how often we say this. And it's quite deflating for somebody who's taking a risk. Do you want people to take a risk with new ideas and meetings? If the senior person in the room starts every other sentence with no, it literally puts a damper on things. And that's part of why Marshall literally, I think it's like $20. Every time he go, has these, I've seen him do it. He has these dinners. And then he said, that's 20 bucks. And somebody starts, you know, and it's like 20 bucks. And they all say, okay, it's not, you, you get the point. It's hard to get rid of this. We don't realize how often we do this. And a lot of startup founders, a lot of us generally do it. But I think at the startup phase, when you have to experiment like a hundred times a day, right? You need ideas flowing. You need people putting fresh ideas. What's the next micro pivot we're going to do here? That's like a, an hourly discussion. So anyways, watch yourself. I mean, and have, have actually people that you work with or for say, hey, every time I, I start a sentence with no or but, um, call, call me out or let me know after the fact. Um, this is something that CEOs have a lot of trouble with. It's something that naturally founders do. But when founders do it, and there are only five people at the table, and you're in survival mode, this is actually a kind of a, a big deal. All right. Here's number three. So you could look at the first two that I mentioned and sort of say, you know, it's be softer. It's like, we're about to die. You, what does be softer mean? Uh, that, that's not really what those first two said. But, but this one I see a lot. I just did due diligence. I won't mention the context. I just did due diligence on a founder for, for a funder. And um, one of the things that I heard from funders from prior enterprises that this person had run was they had trouble making hard choices. They hard, had trouble making hard decisions. Now, this is a hard one. We all understand. But it's sort of like the family, the founding team. Here we are, and now it's sort of like somebody's demonstrably, objectively underperforming. Um, how do you make that hard decision? Or how do you pull out of a market? Or how do you say no to a product or service that you really, really, really wanted to be successful? But, it, you know, those are some costs, right? And you have to move on. Um, anyway, I just want to call this out because I think for a lot of you that are funders, it's sort of like this is something I think funders calibrate pretty quickly. It's sort of like can you make, you're going to have to make 10 hard decisions in the first two years of my funding. Are, are you, can, you, can you do that? Um, and, and they're constant. So anyways, this, this kind of family versus hard choices, uh, often it, you know, the family takes over a little, a little too often. Um, but, but I think hard choices too, you could say, but doesn't that, isn't that degrading of, t of, of, of culture, right? 
But I think you've all seen it, right? Have you, you, we've all been in organizations where underperformance is not addressed. Underperformance is not addressed. That's corrosive. It's really corrosive, especially if you're in survival mode. So it better be objectively, right? You better be able to say, here's the case for underperformance here, right? This, it can't be just, I don't like this person. But un, unaddressed underperformance is quite corrosive to culture. And I think it's easy to miss the cultural impact of, of under-addressing underperformance. Um, playing favorites. So this is, you know, it's a human thing. It's a human thing. There are five people at the table. There are ten people in the company, wh whatever the size is. And I think, you know, there's going to be a hierarchy. There's, there's a functional mix. There, there are reasons why you're going to talk to somebody as a founder or, or the team of founders more than other people. But this, this is something that I think we, we, all of us can be more conscious of, and especially founders. Because the sort of corrosive effects of other people feeling like you're really not merit-based in the way that you, you treat certain people on this team. At least none of us think it's true. I mean, you really, really, really like that person, or you really just feel more at home with that person. And it's like, that's corrosive to belonging and lots of other things that people, people need to need and feel, right? So this is sometimes a hard one to calibrate for oneself. But if you ask people on your team, especially somebody, so one of the things I learned from Laura Tyson when I first became dean is, um, you know, th this is at the high school, so it's a bigger organization than a startup. But she said when she became dean, somebody had given her this advice, she created a kitchen cabinet among the faculty. This kind of very informal advisory board. And I, we're talking three, four, five faculty. Um, I, I know this because she asked me to, to help, help her on this. But the important thing is there are going to be people, even if it's one person and you're the founder that's in your organization where you could pull them aside and say, can I have a confidential conversation with you? Do you think I'm playing favorites? And, and do you think other people think I'm playing favorites? Anyways, maybe the answer is no, but you need somebody who can speak truth to, to leadership, right? And I, I think most of us have have a confidant or two that we could, we could ask a question like that. But this, this gets pretty corrosive pretty fast because, you know, it's, it feels unfair. It, it feels like it's not a meritocracy. It, feel, it feels like a lot of things that you kind of need for, for, for effectiveness early on. Um, so th this, we, we've heard this one, I think, a lot in leadership and management more generally, right? The importance of authenticity was, was called out this morning in the keynote. This idea of... Um, regret and weakness, um, but, you know, people, I'll just, I'll just speak for myself, when, when, it, when a leader says, I got that one wrong, or we got that one wrong, and that was my decision, or whatever, um, that's, most people consider that very empowering. It, there are just very few people where it's like, oh, you really shouldn't have admitted that. It's really quite the opposite. And it's hard for people who are at the top of the stack to do that. It's almost like something psychologically comes over us where it's sort of like, I need to be flawless. And, and so anyways, this one, this one, all of us have seen it. And when we sort of recognize it in ourselves and how positively we get feedback when we let people know, wow, okay, I, I never should have said that. And if I say anything like that again, call me out on it, right? It could be something that small, right? call me out on it. That goes a long way for people. You, you all know that. But um, you also, I think, may recognize that in a lot of leaders we work with, this kind of never comes up. It's sort of like they're, they're playing a different image game. And, and that, can, that can, by itself can get quite corrosive. Um, you know, but, uh, let me go back to that. Because you know, we've all heard the word pivot in, in, in this field, right? It's something of a, of a buzzword, but it's very important. I think I used the word micro-pivot before. I don't know if anybody else uses that term. But, but the idea is we're constantly evolving what we're doing here, right? And so, so some of this could be the easier stuff. It's sort of like there was a, whatever, a small... It's not like we bet the store, we got it wrong, we're folding. That's, uh, I mean, if, if you're folding, you're folding. But... But this, this can be a relatively anodyne admission, right? It's sort of like, yeah, we tried that out. It just did not work. I thought it was going to work. You heard me talk about it. It didn't work. I got that wrong. Here's why I think I got it wrong. But, you know, 
etc. Okay, here's number seven. I know we're going through this very quickly, but we have, um, we're going to have some time for discussion. I think the discussion will be great because I know there's something that I didn't put on this list where you'd say, well, I've seen like N founders lose it on the culture front for this reason. But, so this is another one. I think this is not unrelated with the smartest person in the room comment, right? It's, it's this idea that, um, you know, do we, do we give credit to other people, right? I think this can also be a tricky one because it's like, you know, is, is the giving of credit sounding authentic? Is, is it real? But um, people... People that are good at this, especially in, in startup small group situations, if you think back of a situation where, where you, it could be in any context, but you're relatively new in a company. It doesn't have to be a new company, but you're relatively new in a company, and it could be a new company. Um, and somebody says, when you did that, that was awesome. That was terrific. Keep doing that. We never forget a comment like that. Right? You never forget a comment like that. I still remember, you know. And so, you know, I think it's just when, when, when your head's down and you are in survival mode because you are in survival mode, um, this stuff can drop away pretty, pretty quickly. And I think it's one of the things that, that founders, uh, especially people, you know, not all founders are early on in their career, that's for sure, but... Uh, I think the, the, the more seasoned we get as managers and leaders, the less often we make this mistake. But we, I think all of us could, could get, get better at this. You know? I'll give you one, a super small example, and then I'm going to stop because I want to hear from you. Um, we, the fact, so in the university, so I'm going to a university environment, big environment, okay, so not a, not a founder. But a, a group, we get asked to be on task forces all the time. And it's usually because there's some sticky issue. It's like some senior leader says, we're going to have a task force on that. You know, companies do this too, obviously. And then, you know, very senior people, busy people. In this case, it was a faculty task force. And they were writing on, it was called Report on Entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley. So that's, that's the title. And it was written in 2018, so before my job was created. My job was created in 2020, and, I, and that's when I started in my current job for, for Berkeley. Um, and I read that report. And it was a really good report. And thanks to people other than me, a bunch of the things that were in that report actually got implemented. And I was rereading it the other day, not that long ago, a couple months ago. And I realized, man, it's like almost every, now it's five years later, but so many task forces, there's like nada. It's like the problem I was trying to solve is because I created a task force so people wouldn't keep asking me about this. Um, as opposed to we need to make some changes. So the university made a bunch of changes. Anyways, long story short, I sent an email to the 10 faculty who wrote that report five years later, and I simply said, here are 10 things, big things that the university did based on your report. Thank you. Now, that didn't take me very long. And I got lucky, because I just happened to be reading that report. But they felt so fulfilled by that. And these are busy, you know, these are senior faculty, all these kind of famous people, but it's sort of... Anyways, again, I, I really, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm great at this. I'm just saying you, you, a, a couple of those and you realize, man, bunch of value, wasn't hard. I need to get better at kind of thinking, thinking through that, okay? So um, I'm going to stop there. What, what's, what's missing? Please, ma'am. Oh, I may have skipped one. I did. Thank you for that. How did you know that? Did I go through it twice or did I, I just clicked it twice? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so this is an interesting one. And, and you see this. Um, you, thank you for that. Wow. You did, um, so, no, it was not. It, it was not. Um, but I, so with this one, again, like, none of these are you going to read this and say, completely unambiguous, completely important, I hadn't been thinking about this, thank you for putting it on a slide. Uh, none of these are going to hit you that way. And this one, too, it's sort of like, all right, um, we just talked about authenticity. It's sort of like, I mean, how special are you? You want 10 million of my dollars? I mean, you'd better be pretty special. You want me to commit to be on your founding team for, for three years? Uh, I want to see something pretty special. I think, though, there is also this place 
I mean, where it's sort of like, all right, I am, specialness becomes my craft. Specialness becomes my craft. Uh, just to use an obvious example, but I think a lot of people look at a Sam Bankman Freed and it's sort of like, specialness became his craft. Walking into meetings with zero preparation and no shoes on, you know. And so you could say, well, that's kind of, there's a lot of success in Silicon Valley that comes from specialness, right? Um, so, this is, again, it's not an unambiguous thing. But I think this, this one can connect to, to ego pretty, pretty tightly. I was asked a question, I meant I shared this with you. I was asked a question about, there was a group of senior administrators from, from Berkeley, um, Many of them retired, people that, that you would know the names of. And the, the woman asked me this question. She said, what's the hardest leadership lesson to teach? It's like right out of the blue. You got 10 people like, go ahead, answer it. <laughs> it's just like, oh, man. Um, and, and it's a great question. So what I said was, I think whether you're early on in your career Gosh, I was an overconfident undergraduate at 18 here at Berkeley. Um, or it's later on in your career, and now, you know, everybody's deferring to you and, and so forth. Um, keeping one's ego in check. That's what I said. I think people get taken over by their own ego in ways that they just don't recognize. And it gets the better of them. And people can tell you that up and down and sideways. And of course, confidence is, is important. I'm not saying, but it's really hard to keep that in check. And anyway, I don't know if that's the best answer in the world, but, but I think some of this, it's sort of like, everybody wants to talk to me. I'm the CEO. We're the hottest thing out there. Boom. That's heady stuff. And at some level, it's like, ride the wave. Yeah, but, but, you know, there are places that this goes where it's, chart, you know, people say that's, that's no longer productive. That's no longer productive. Anyways, um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, questions? Here, I'll, 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 we have some time. So I think we have till 1230. So we got time. Please. All right. So I have one addition and one question. Great. Uh, addition, not enforcing the cultural standards that you've worked so hard to invest in and create and develop and hide the company I work for, because well, we used to work for, I guess it doesn't matter, but you know, my boss didn't use our, our, the systems that his boss had and so on. And, Interesting. Uh, Thank you for that. I love it. I love it. Let, let me, well, why don't you do your second piece and I'll speak to that first. Sure. Yeah. I, think the, I think it was maybe number three or number two. You talked about uh, however, but, maybe it was the one before that, yeah. uh, but however, but, etc. Okay, what do you do? What's yeah. a better way? Uh, okay, that's good. Hard. Good question. So, so um, because you do have to disagree, right? It's sort of like there has to be room for dissent. That was one of the things that I mentioned. Let's have a conversation and ask ourselves in our team meetings, is there enough room for dissent for crying out loud? Right? So, so that's really important. But there's a big difference between no as a first word and a question where you say, what about, what about this over here or you know, a question, remember, she, the, the, the last talk, she said, it's coming questions rather than answers, right? So if you sort of asked, why am I saying no? You, you, anyways, so I, I think it's pretty subtle stuff. It's sort of like de facto, it's sort of like, oh, I don't think this landed very well. But, but there's something about no, however. I, I put an idea on the, on the table and then no, that, whatever. It, so, so got a dissent, but I think there are a lot of ways to, to dissent in ways with a question or other things. Um, there, there, okay, so there's a mic up here. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, I just want to tell you how kind you were when I was here in 2013 with everybody, and that's something that stayed with me for Thank all you. these years. Thank you. Your kindness, Thank you. which I think it's important for leaders to have. Um, I had to. I, I founded the company four years ago. We were a small company, 22 people, and this really resonates. Uh, I have something about family versus uh, 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 hard decisions. Yep. I had to have a therapy session the first time I fired someone. Yes. <laughs> and my therapist said something that stayed with me. She said, "Aliyah, you are stopping this person from following their path." Interesting. By yeah. keeping them. Yeah. So that really changed my mindset of things. So I'm like, I'm freeing you to follow your path. 
yeah. and the the one thing um, also that was very hard for me that uh, I would have added to this list is nobody cares about what you're doing as much as you do. Yeah. Uh, because I cared so much about uh, the company that when I don't see other people caring so much about we what we do, uh, either I'm very frustrated or my level of control increases because I want like no, you have to care as much. Exactly. And the 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 time I released that. I realized this is a job for them, you know, they finish at six, they finish at six. Uh, employees got even more um, involved. Oh, that's because nice. uh, we start thinking about what is interesting for them in this. What do you get out of it, not what just I get out of you. Yeah, I, lo so. I, love, I love both of those points. Thank you for that. I think, you know, there's, sometimes there's a distinction between the founding team in the narrow, like it's two or three or four of us. It's like, friend, you've got... 20% of the equity here, <laughs> you gotta be, you'd better be all in. And, you know, employee 10, 12, 20, which is, I think, a little bit more in the spirit of your comment, which I, I totally agree with. Um, also, look, we've all, I think, everybody in this room has had to let somebody go. And that, we do that as thoughtfully as we possibly can. But when, when we feel like the case is clear and the data are clear. I think it, it really does. Look, this is not working for you here. Uh, my, my kids are just, one's just out of college, one's just, uh, just uh, well, she's a sophomore in college. And anyways, the son who's out of college had some tough you know, job market interviews and things like that. But, but I think what, part of it was, look, that, that probably wasn't the right job for him. I think they, were, you know, they ended up saying no for things that probably, I mean, you can ex post rationalize anything, but I, I really think that that's, that was true, so I agree with that. You know, I did not, let me comment on your, your, let me just mention this idea of do the leaders themselves sort of implement, work hard on cultural principles that they lay down? And often they don't, right? We know that. And so I, I think that does belong uh, high up on, on any list. Um, part of it, too, is if, if so remember, make it executable. Remember I mentioned that? If you, gosh, I just, I always do this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use a word. And, and it might be one of your, your core principles of your company. I apologize. Um, excellence. Excellence is a terrific word. We aspire to excellence, we get it, we get it, right? But, you know, when, when you're the CEO, I think part of it is you have to be out there feeling proud about saying that word. You have to be out there and saying, we separate on that. We're totally, this, we're all about this. And, and it's like, if you're using the three or four words, if somebody said, core values, and then you said, what three or four words first come to mind? Uh, most of you would come up with the same, same words. Most of the other business schools came up with the same words. If you looked at the core values of the other top 10 business schools, give it a try. It's a lot of overlap. <laughs> and when there are words like that, the deans don't talk about it because it's not, it's not something special. And so, so making it executable, I think making it different is part of that. But even if it is different, right, people, it's sort of like, is this an important thing or not? So one of the things that I sometimes say to people is, if you're not committed to it, remember that I, I mentioned this idea. If you're meeting somebody and they're not, not a good example, exemplar of confidence without attitude, then maybe you shouldn't come here. It's sort of like, if you just never mention it, if you don't drive it through your business processes, it's like, that, that can be, that can have negative effects. It's like, why do we even go through that? So, so I think the execution piece is, if you're like not really committed, one of the things that the hospital said is, we want to be the most, the most distinguished by culture, I think hyphens, distinguished by culture business school. That was a vision statement. There's a future state. We think we could own that. And, but it's sort of like, if, 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 you, if you don't have a kind of destination in mind here, people won't talk about it, they won't implement it, and then it's, then it, you know, it's worth having that conversation early on, where, where it's like, come on, we got, we got to really do this. Um, next one here, thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Sears, I'm 05 full time. Um, the one I didn't see up there is micromanaging, ah. the, the short form, and yep. the last three founder CEOs I've worked with thought that because they developed an algorithm or created a new database, that they suddenly knew how to do marketing. Yep. Um, and, and 
they hired me to be the expert on marketing, and I spent a lot of my time and my team's time managing up and kind of, you want to listen to the ideas, but you also want to get to the execution and jumping in. Is, I see pieces of that in your seven, but, yeah. I, but it seemed like it wasn't fully covered by any I of I think it. it wasn't. I think it wasn't. I completely take that point. I think it's an ex excellent example. You know, some of that, too, is sort of, uh, I, when I was first a manager, I think I micromanaged, right? And, and the, our keynote said exactly the same thing, right? Here's my playbook. Just go implement it, right? And, and um, so, so that, that, that one can, be, uh, uh, can correlate with young founder versus, versus more mature manager founder. Um, but I, I completely take that point. I think it's, you, we, could, we could easily find one of my seven that that's, and several of these ideas that we could replace with it. But I, I think that one, it, it's a phrase that everybody gets. And then part of you know, the, the antidote, if you will, is how do we make sure that that's getting called out. So for example, one of the things that you could ask is, if remember I said that trusted advisor thing, I was talking about that, right? It's like, do you have somebody, look, do people think I micromanage or I over, over manage? Uh, and do you think I do? And do you have somebody in the organization that would answer that truthfully? That's a valuable person. Um, and, and maybe that's part of managing culture, right? Did you ask somebody that question in a safe enough environment that they're able to say to you, actually, I am hearing some stuff, right? So when we start thinking about what do I do tomorrow, sort of like ask somebody that question if you're a, if you're a senior leader. Or if you're a funder and you think this might be problematic, you could say to your CEO, ask somebody you totally trust this question. Or here are the three questions based on what I heard here that you should ask somebody you trust. And because because the funders and, and the board are, are unlikely to get that kind of feedback. But you want to make sure the CEO or the founder is getting getting that feedback. Great, great question. Please. Ravi Shankar, MBA 98. Is there a cultural um, variation, uh, is there a regional variation to the culture? Uh, the reason I ask this question is one of the defining cultures within my company is people stay for a very long time. Yes. But I see that happening while in Europe and in Asia. In the US, the turnover is higher than the other two regions. So do you adjust your culture based on regions? Yeah, well, I think, I think it definitely is different, right? Kind of work norms and, and, and behaviors in different regions and different company cultures or regional cultures. There's no question about it. Um, you know, when we think about, for example, if you just thought about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and you thought about how we think about that in the US, and then I remember, it doesn't matter which, but I had a job for a couple of years in a multinational with a very big India business. And you know, we were putting out surveys and people could self-select into their you know, gender identity, for example. And it's, look, there are places where this is a lot more complicated than in the US. So anyways, that's just a, an obvious example of where uh, you know, a norm in one country, especially around kind of societal or social norms, is radically different in, in others, including illegal, right? If they answered your survey the way your survey question allows them to answer and they did it truthfully, they would be admitting something illegal in their country and, and culture. Um, so, but, but I think for, for much of the stuff that we're talking about, um, we, we could debate, uh, so I think of a lot of these as like micromanaging, uh, you know, some of these are, are really hum human nature things. I think they're quite general. But I think a number of them where it's sort of like, like in Japan, right? So I mentioned excessive need to be me and, you know, that sort of thing. You probably all heard the phrase, and it's an overgeneralization, but it's a phrase that people use. Um, the, the nail that sticks out gets pounded, right? Conformity is a really big deal, right? And so, you know... Our, our keynote talked about fitting in or, or standing apart. The, 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 the role of conformity in different regions and country cultures is so different, right? So you might, might answer that question a little differently. But I, I feel that the things that people have mentioned and some of the things that are up there are pretty, are pretty going to apply in an awful lot of places, right? Giving credit where, where credit is due or thinking about any, any of the seven. But... But I, but I think as you think, if you're thinking about a global business and you're thinking about different country cultures, 
one, I think a good exercise would be which of the seven of those or which of the 10, 12, you know, the five additional ones that have come up, would I vary based on kind of context, regional context? That, that's, that's, that's a good question. Some of them almost surely you would a bit. I don't know where the next, up here, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sure that you're familiar with Ray Dalio's philosophy of radical transparency and most of us here have heard of it. Yeah. Um, my question to you is pretty open-ended. It's uh, what do you think of that philosophy and how does that relate to the principles that you've put up? Yeah, well, good. You know, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a student of, of Dalio's radical uh, transparency, but, I, you know, I've read about it and, and most of you have too. You know, my, my own thinking goes in that direction. There, but, there, you know, transparency... Uh, communicating transparently and having difficult conversations. I remember the first time somebody sort of said, here's a leadership development program. I was the chief learning officer for two years at Goldman Sachs. And any company like that, you know, would have sessions on difficult conversations. It's just really important. And early on in your career, it's like I've had no practice at difficult conversations and laying somebody off, right? A perfect example. Um, so, so there are difficult conversations and there are difficult conversations. And, and I've seen, like I oversee uh, technology licensing at Berkeley. And, and when we think about, look, the, the job of a technology licensor, they're negotiators. They are absolutely negotiators. That's really what they do. And they're very, very good at what they do. But if you also said, where does the client service come, come in? The reason I'm bringing this up is, there's radical transparency in the sense that we're going to have the difficult conversations. We're going to interrogate ideas. There, there, is, there is room for dissent on this team. I subscribe to those things. There is also sort of like, I'm going to say what's on my mind. And I'm going to use but, and I'm going to use not, whenever, pardon my language, I damn well please. And it's sort of like, do you need to go there to get the benefits of a Dalio type philosophy? I don't think so, right? And so I, I th mo it's like we can't shy away from difficult conversations and we can have them in much more productive ways than others. A, a lot of us have seen in the meetings where it's sort of like somebody more tactful could have gotten that same idea across without breaking a bunch of glass in this room. And that's, 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 I'm not saying he's, he's promoting breaking glass, but some people can look at that and sort of go to a place that, that can get less productive. But in general, I agree with it directionally. Um, I think, okay. Okay, great. Yeah, please. Hello. Hi. Um, I think a good list of uh, uh, the principles or mistakes not to make, even for people like us working in bigger companies. So my question is a little different. Like, what is your thought on Elon Musk, who may have been making some of these mistakes, and why so successful despite that? And is there an alternate road to culture uh, to what you are presenting? Yes. Um, thanks for that point. You know, one of the things that I, if you took the Haas leadership principles, you know, like confidence without attitude, beyond yourself, let's just take those two. Are there terrific, very successful leaders who do not conform to those two principles? Absolutely. 100% yes. So the idea that this is the one true model and it's the only way you can be and it's the only way you can, you can be successful as a leader, that, that point is rubbish. And we know it. So at the end of the day, it's like, well, what values do you want your life to be about? That's the question I hope we've all asked ourselves for years and years and years. I mean, it's as fundamental a question as, as it gets, I think. That can come from faith and philosophy and whatever it comes from. But at the end of the day, it's like, what do you really care about? What, are, what things are non-negotiable? So, so I, think, I think I take the spirit of your question. Look, Elon is, is singular at a number of things. But a number of the things that we've talked about is like clear violation, right? So. What do I think? I'm not, I don't, I'm not an expert at Elon Musk, but let me give you one thing that I think he's singularly good at. That I, in fact, I, I was in Laura's class, just, she teaches a class called Living with Agency. It's an absolutely terrific class. How do you develop a sense of personal agency? And it's an undergraduate class. Anyways, 
I was brought in to give my top three bits of leadership advice. And here's, one, here's the first one that I mentioned. Paint the picture. Paint the big picture. Learn how to paint the big picture and be the one on the team that paints the big picture. Now, you could call that vision or whatever, but it's sort of like, no. Now, that takes practice. That's a craft. Elon is uncomparable at that. It's like, boom, space. <laughs> Tesla. It's like, you don't have to, if you are a great picture painter, you do not have to explain every step between here and there. But I promise you, if you are proposing a big change and people can't see a destination, it's a lot less likely to succeed. Paint the big picture of the destination. Anyways, he is outstanding at that. And I think that's part of, you know, that can, that can offset an awful lot of some of these things. But, um, but I think more, more broadly, it, it's, again, if you, so people self-select. People have self-selected into the new Twitter. Right? He said, if you like this work environment, and some people like that work environment. So, so you're basically saying, we're going to play a different culture strategy. And the question is, is it going to win in equilibrium? I think at Twitter, it's still unclear. But, but, and, and there are other things at play other than just, it's a culture bet. But in a big way, Twitter was a culture bet, right? The way he said to people, right? It's like, you, got, you better be ready to work hard. If you're not, you, you should take our package. Anyways, so great question. And, um, but my own view is things are still trending towards some of the things that, that Haas does well. That, that it's less and less a command and control world. It's more and more an influence beyond authority world where trust really matters. And some of the things that we're talking about, respect and trust, are things that, um, that th these principles, I think, support. So I don't know who's got the next right here. Thank you. OK, good. I'll be quicker in my answers. Rich, thank you so much for this wonderful session. Dusin Yegazarian, 2008, uh, MBA class. Um, one thing I wanted to add, a variation on the family and the hard choices. I think one thing that could expand this a little bit is clarity of the intersection of common interests. Mm. And I'll, I'll share a couple of stories. Last two companies have been associated with, in a CFO role uh, or a lead independent director role where family without the brackets. So father. Uh, started the company 30 years ago, chairman of the board, son is the CEO of the company, two SVPs, the daughters, and uh, extended family members, shareholders of uh, privately owned pre-IPO, very large companies. So at the time when you are the independent director that is uh, coordinating and mitigating a lot of you know, family board discussions or in an executive leadership role in the CFO role, uh, clarity, it wasn't really a communication or family versus hard choices. Is uh, how do you really bring the decision makers, the stakeholders together around the shared common interests? And yeah. that was the solution to that particular couple of situations. So yeah. I wanted to kind of to provide that, but also what's your perspective on hard choices, but narrowing it down to coming from the interests that are really common for the stakeholders? Yeah, well, it's a super question. I mean, I think. Often when we think about change leadership, right? So shared values, shared actions to achieve something. And sometimes it's really about changeability. It's about adaptability. And we say, yeah, I want my organization to be innovative. It's sort of like, do you have a culture that drives innovation or don't you, right? So these are, these are objectives that you're trying to design into the, the, the DNA of your company. Um, and part of, as you know, part of change leadership is yeah, we can right, paint the picture. There's this big picture. But it's sort of like, put a benefit statement on the picture. What does that picture mean to you? It's going to mean something different to you and different to you, but are, is there enough overlap in the way we see that picture? Right? Because sometimes we, do, we paint a picture and somebody says, cool picture, but I don't win in that picture. Right? My department goes away in that picture, or my job goes away. Right? And so you know, part of it, I think, is helping people um, you know, there's often more overlap than people can see. So part of the picture painting, I think, is also putting the benefit statement on the overlap. Let me give you a, a concrete example. At the Haas School, right? So there are a lot of people on the faculty that, like me, are economists. And, and the idea that w culture is going to be an important part of our strategy, our strategic plan 10 years ago, sort of like, whatever, right? It's like, he's the dean. Just go out and raise money, and you, you, we'll be good. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things that, that it was, is helpful is sort of like, I, I sent a, 
an email to the faculty almost annually, benefits to you from our culture strategy. Be happy to share that email with people if you'd like to see it. Five exec ed clients came to us last year and said we, we had proposals from School X, School Y, and Haas. We are now a client at Haas Exec Ed. We asked students, what tipped the balance? When you had another great school you could go to and you said, I'm going to Haas, the third most cited reason was the region, technology, Silicon Valley. I wanted to be here for my MBA. Second most cited, reputation ranking, about the same number. Most cited reason, culture-defining principles, with three times as many sites as the, first, uh, the second two. That's, ta that's a talent decision. That's not awareness. Hey, people know about us. It's sort of like talent is coming here because of this. Anyways, so, so, but I think the faculty couldn't see those things. The second thing, the, the last point that I made was we put the strategic plan and we said, oh, I'm going to set up a strategic planning committee and I'm a new dean and so forth. No, 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 that wasn't the name of it. It was called the Campaign and Strategy Task Force or Working Group because we were going into a capital campaign and I told the faculty, we go into a capital campaign, the philanthropic capital markets, once a decade. We either go in with a compelling story or we don't. And that culture strategy was a big part of that particular strategic plan. And our board was 100% behind that because the board knew how important that was. So anyways, those were ways of helping people see the commonality. Now the question one here. Up, yeah. Sorry, and then the last one down here. Okay. Um, Juan Calgarrido, MBA 03. Um, I would like to put another um, input into this recipe of culture, Great. which is the following. Um, 80% or more of our behavior is ruled by the subconscious. This is something which is scientific. Uh, subconscious are things that we cannot write on a paper. I mean, it's the behavior that we take, and I am an engineer, I'm not a psychologist, uh, so sorry for the wording, maybe it's not the, the right one. But basically, most of our behavior will be given by the subconscious. The thing is that if we are in a survival mode, we yeah. go back to our animal part, and our subconscious rules. So there is a big mi mi uh, sorry, mismatch between what we may have written on a paper of our value, not the values, but more our, our culture parameters, yeah. and what is the real behavior of in an organization, yeah. which is how people behave on a daily basis. Um, right now, there are tools to diagnose that, which basically is using virtual reality applied to neuroscience. Um, this is something that started with um, clinical psychology and now is being used in, in organizations. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of interest to know what is Berkeley as, un as a university doing in terms of fostering this part, which is, I think, the, well, I believe it can be the future in terms of understanding culture and shaping cultures in organizations, not only for founders, but also in huge organizations. More broadly, yeah. It's a great question. You know, we have one of the, Jennifer Chapman and Samir Srivastava, two of our faculty that are absolute world experts in this area. They've created a, a culture center that is, I think, the, the, the best convening culture center in the whole country among academics and so forth. So I don't have a, a good quick answer to, you know, the, 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 the neurophysical studies of how our brains work. You know, you've, you've probably heard the phrase amygdala hijack, right? This idea that, look, there are parts of your brain that are like the oldest parts, the reptile parts, and when they flash, you're probably going to do something wrong as a manager, and, right? But, um, but we do have people thinking about that, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I, I agree with your point. The, the only point that I would like to add, and then we'll go to the last question, is this. Um, you know, it, to, to, to say that it is really kind of fight or flight, it, we're in an instinct world. You know, one, reasonable people can disagree, but I think even in a startup setting, the idea is we can bring more intentionality than we otherwise would, even if there's an awful lot of instinct going on. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I think there's, there's, there's locus of control potential there still. Uh, one more, okay, so this is the last one. I will hang around a little bit afterwards if anybody wants to come up and talk to me. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, so just a comment on the previous question. My answer would be meditation. Meditation. So, there we go. You can come talk to me. I, li I so, like it. Um, the question here is actually, I've been with a 
joined a startup about 15 years back, and uh, we had a pretty well-defined culture. And there was a founder who was implementing it, and the early employees, we were part of that culture. And then as the company began to grow, goes through various stages of growth, and new employees come in, but we have never been able to maintain that culture. I've seen this now in two companies, yeah. as the companies go from a technology to be a business and goes through various phases. What is your observation for a company to have the longevity to maintain that culture? Um, Haas is an academic institution, has a pretty well-defined structure. I know business world is changing. The culture has really helped. What would be your advice to companies to maintain that culture uh, over a period of things that are changing? Do you keep it always constant? Do you change it? Do you add to it? Comments on that, please. Yeah, it's a super question and a big, big topic. Um, look, you know, when people say it's one thing when you hire, you know, three more staff members at Haas. It's another when we go from five people to 25 in three weeks or whatever, right? So, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and there's no easy, easy answer. But I would say that, you know, we use the term onboarding, onboarding, onboarding this, right? It's sort of like, no, what are the very first conversations that people have with a person coming on, right? If you're a six-person company and you're going to 10 over the next two months, whatever, sort of like, what are the very first conversations? And, and so that's part, like at Haas, for example, we looked at the admissions letters, right? Now delivered electronically, not, not in, in US mail. But it's sort of like the admission letter is an incredibly triumphant moment for people. They open that thing up. Now the admissions letters mention something about, hey, the fit, you know, these four defining principles are cited, the fit with the culture and, and other things. We really want you to be part of it. But it, so we just added a couple of sentences. But it's like an admission letter that has those sentences versus doesn't have those sentences. Is anybody paying attention? It, it only takes you five minutes to add those sentences. But it's sort of like that's an onboarding experience. What are the 10 most important onboarding experiences? And they could be that small. It's sort of like what did their offer letter look like? <laughs> And did it mention? And so I, I think so. Startups is like, come on, we don't have an HR department. We don't. We, we're, we're just right. It's sort of like just go to lunch with some people and ask like, what are the five most important earliest experiences of the people we hire, and how do we drill what we think is important for success into those culturally? I promise you, the delta on just that one exercise is would be significant, and it's very easy to not do that, right? And this is not a heavy allocation of resources and time to just be thoughtful about. And, and it's still hard, right? It's still hard. But at least people will know where you're coming from, OK? Uh, I think we have to stop. You Thank you. I think I turned this off, but it seems to me still working. There's good. OK. Um, so uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to just play one song. Somebody mentioned meditation, right? This is my meditation. I, you know, I just, it's where I go in the morning, and it, it helps, helps to decompress and all the rest of it. Um, so this is a song that, that just gets me, gets me up. It gets me going. Um, if it looks like I'm kind of forgetting where I am, this is just sort of the way I play it when I get a chance to play it. Allow me to introduce myself I'm a man of wealth and taste Been around for a long, long year Stole many a man's soul and faith Was around when Jesus Christ Had his moment of doubt and pain Made down the show the pilot Washed in his hands, seen his feet. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. 
What's puzzling you is just the nature of my game. Mm, yeah. Hung around St. Petersburg when I saw it was time for a change. Killed the Tsar and his ministers, Anastasia screamed in vain. Well, the tank with the general's rank when the blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank. Pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name. What's posing you is just the nature of my name. Mm -hmm. Just as every cop is a criminal And all sinners saints Heads his tails call me Lucifer Cause I'm in need of some restraint If you meet me have some courtesy Have some sympathy and some taste Use all your well-learned politics or I'll lay your soul waste. Mm -hmm. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. What's puzzling you is just the nature of my game. What's my name? Tell me, honey. What's my name? Oh, dear, dear. Now, no, 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 Please allow me to introduce myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.